good morning. It is the last day of the year, and it's fitting that we're finishing with our lessons from the book of Titus. <clears throat> Paul brings his letter to Titus to a close by doing two things by advising him on how to avoid division in the church, and then by expressing gratitude for faithful workers. Our text comes from Titus chapter 3. First of all, we're going to read verses 9 through 11, which discuss the topic of how to avoid division. Titus 3, beginning in verse 9. <clears throat> but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law. For they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Now we know there were many divisions in the Lord's church during Paul's day. You just go read 1 Corinthians and you read about all the various divisions and the various topics that cause divisions. Well, those divisions scarred the church. They created barriers between Christians. And so here Paul tells Titus, here are some things to look out for that will cause divisions. He says the first thing is these foolish questions or foolish disputes. These are kinds that they didn't edify God's people, nor did they bring glory to God. Uh, even today... People, many, sadly, focus on uh, questions, um, ideas, topics that have no benefit whatsoever to a person's faith and practice. We go back a few pages to 2 Timothy 2, and we notice what he says there in verse 23, which is very similar, you know, uh, Paul is writing to a, a young preacher, Timothy, and he tells him in 2 Timothy 2.23, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. That's the same thing he's telling Titus here in Titus chapter 3, verse 9. Avoid these type because they do nothing but cause division. And then he says it's the same thing with genealogies. Genealogy, of course, is just a list of a descent of a person from an ancestor. But some people were using them <clears throat> in many ways that did not edify God or, or edify people. You know, who your ancestors were have no relevance concerning your salvation. None whatsoever. Back in Paul's first letter to Timothy... In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says this beginning in verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. He says, do what? Don't give any heed to them. In other words, those type of things are not profitable. See, our focus of really a Christian's life needs to be the clear teachings of God's word, not useless inquiries about ancestry. Just causes division. And then he says contentions and strivings about the law. You know, reading the book of Acts and, and going through many of the letters, you see where <clears throat> there were many people in the first century that had contentions about, well, you've got to keep at least part of the Mosaical Law. Remember the Jerusalem Council uh, was, uh, you know, that's why they had to meet there in Acts chapter 15. Because they were considering... You know, there's been a lot of problems about people saying you've got to be circumcised or you've got to do this or that in the old law. And, of course, that conference said no one, basically, that was their result, did not keep the old law. Why? Because it was nailed to the cross. 
There was no benefit from it anymore. There was no power in it anymore. And so Paul is telling Titus, avoid those type of things. They're just going to cause divisions. That mosaical law, it, it had a purpose. It fulfilled that purpose. Now it's dead. It, it, it is not the law which people are to abide by. Well, then he says, these are unprofitable and they're useless. In other words, they have no benefit for the Christian whatsoever. So all of those things, these few foolish questions and disputes, you know, questions about genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law, none of those have any benefit. They're, they're not, they don't edify Christians. They don't teach the lost. Uh, and they certainly don't bring glory to God. So he says, avoid them. Avoid them. So he says, well, what happens if there is someone there who is trying to cause division? So he says, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. A factious person. <clears throat> Back when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 11, of course, there was a lot of division in the church in Corinth. He says this in the 11th chapter, verses 17 and 18. <clears throat> now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, for, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. Of course, he began 1 Corinthians there in chapter 1, verse 10, talking about unity. And people needed to be unified upon God's word. Well, now we've got a divisive person trying to divide the congregation. And he's obviously trying to divide them over something that is not according to God's word. So after he's been admonished, rebuked twice, what are you supposed to do? Reject that person. See, this is a person who is forsaking God's word just to please themselves. Maybe they want to cause division. Back again in 1 Corinthians, this time chapter 3, verse 3, we have this. <clears throat> Paul says, For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? See, God desires unity. I mentioned 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice what he says there in verses 10 and 11. He says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. And of course, there were contentions. So, Paul is telling Titus, Titus, if there comes in a guy who's doing nothing other than trying to cause division, you know, he's, he's ignoring God's word, he's, he's causing division by his opinions or false uh, teachings or whatever, you reprimand him twice. If he's still causing division, the church needs to sever the relationship with that individual. Now, this is not the only place that the Holy Spirit tells us this. At the end of Paul's letter to the church at Rome, tells us much the same thing. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. It says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but serve their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. You reprimand this guy twice for causing division. If he's still causing it, you avoid him. You reject him. You have nothing to do with him. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we have these words. 
that Paul tells the church at Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 says, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. These are people who are causing division for no reason. They're just causing division. They're not following God's word. <clears throat> and what are they supposed to do? Reprimand him twice. If he doesn't do something about it, repent, confess his wrong, then you reject him. You avoid him. You have no fellowship with him. Because Paul says, this man is warped and sinning. Warped is the idea of, you know, he's turned away from God's word. He's sinning. This is, is uh, present tense. He, he won't stop it. In other words, he's obstinate in his rebellion. He won't change his ways. He's continuing to rebel against God, and therefore he's become what? Self-condemned. So, why does the church need to do this? Why does the church need to reject him, avoid him, withdraw fellowship from him? Well, it's for one thing, hopefully, that he will see this and then turn from his ways and do what's right. But also, it's to save others in the congregation from their consequences. Notice what Jude writes in that short book, Jude, verses 8 through 11. <clears throat> Jude, beginning in verse 8. Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally like brute beasts, and these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Very, very serious warning that Paul gives Titus. Well, then he ends up, his message is on a very positive note, <clears throat> because now he gives gratitude for these different faithful workers that he's worked with. <clears throat> beginning at verse 12. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on the journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith, Grace be with you all. Amen. You know, the wise man Solomon wrote about the value of having faithful companions. You've heard this probably before, maybe at uh, weddings. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, this is what the wise man says. Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9. He says this, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls. For he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Faithful companion. Wise man said they're very important and Paul knows it. The Apostle Paul knew how important having these trustworthy co-workers. So he mentions them by name. And he does this in practically every letter that we have in the New Testament. He will, somewhere in the letter, be thankful for these faithful co-workers. And so he mentions several here. <clears throat> Well, even in the Old Testament, before we do that, remember the account about Moses, you know, holding up his hand as long as he held it up. God's people was victorious. 
But his, if his hand started to drop, his arm started to drop, they began to lose. So what did Aaron and Hur do? Held up his hands. They were faithful companions. So Paul mentions this. Uh, he mentions Artemis. He mentions Tychicus. This is uh, one of Paul's associates or assistants. Back in Ephesians chapter 6, this man is mentioned by Paul in a very positive light. Beginning in verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 6, he says, but, the, but that you also may know my affairs and how I'm doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. See, he calls him a beloved brother and a faithful minister. We also have here that <clears throat> Apollos is mentioned. Of course, Apollos had been taught by Priscilla and Aquila. He had preached at Ephesus. He had preached at Corinth. You go back to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 18. You'll read about that. So he was another faithful co-worker. So Paul goes out of his way to mention these people because they are so critical to his work. So how would you characterize a faithful co-worker? Well, they're dependable. They're reliable. Back in Acts chapter 20, we have these words in the first five verses. Romans chapter, or Acts chapter 20 <clears throat> Beginning in verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed there three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. <coughs> and Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Segundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby and Tim Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. Paul, and you know, over and over again, we see Paul mentioning these faithful workers. You know, the Bible tells us that each member of Christ's body depends on the other members to help get the work done. You know, in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about how, you know, not everybody's an eye or not everybody's an ear or not everybody's a foot or a hand. It, it takes every part of the body to get the work done. So that's why reliable, dependable Christians are so important. What else is about, uh, how would you describe a faithful coworker? I wrote down encouraging and supportive. They're encouraging and supportive. At the very end of Acts, in Acts chapter 28, we read this in verse 15. Acts chapter 28 and verse 15. Paul writes, <clears throat> this is when he's arriving at Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as the as Apiforum and three ends. When Paul saw them, notice what happens. He thanked God and took courage. That's what happens when you have encouraging, supportive, faithful Christians who are involved in the work. Thanks God and takes courage. You know, you feel like, yes, we can get a lot of good things done. What else about faithful co-workers? They love the truth of God's word. John, when he writes both 2 John and 3 John, mentions this. First of all, let's go to 2 John verse 4, and then we'll go to 3 John verse 4. <clears throat> 2 John verse 4 says, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. What does he do? He rejoices greatly because what? Some of the Christians there are walking in the truth. And then when he writes 3 John, in verse 4 he says, 
I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. That is one of the greatest things that we can hear about a Christian. They're walking in truth. And then, of course, faithful co-workers are soul winners. He who wins souls is wise. And, of course, that's why Jesus came into the world. So Paul ends his letter to Titus with an emphasis there in verse 14 on good works. And that's what he's emphasized throughout this book. You go back to Titus chapter 1 and you read the whole book and you see how he emphasizes good works. So he's urging these Christians here at the end of his letter to meet the needs of other people, whether it's benevolence, evangelism, whatever, by these good works. And, and we need to abound in good works. Christians need to be known as people who are involved in good works. Back toward the end of Philippians, in Philippians chapter 4, Paul tells the church at Philippi this in verse 17. <clears throat> and notice the result. Not that I seek the gift. This is talking about aid being given. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. To your account. Spiritual account. Good works. Do they have anything to do with salvation? Well, Paul said they do. They have a great deal to do with it. And then in Revelation 14, in a very well-known verse, verse 13 of the 14th chapter of Revelation says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, their good works, and their works follow them. They follow them. So... We need to be zealous because we don't want to be ashamed when Christ comes. Notice how Paul ends verse 14 of Titus chapter 3, that they may not be unfruitful. We want to be fruitful Christians. And that's how Paul ends this letter to Titus. It says, Titus, remind the Christians there in the church, there in Crete, to do what? Maintain good works, meet urgent needs. And that's why Christians are being involved in their whole lives. So as we end this letter to Titus, we need to especially think about are our lives indicative of good works? Are good works displayed in our lives? So we have an invitation song for us to think about our relationship and see if we need to respond. So let's stand and sing this invitation song. <clears throat>